Yes, I'll officially open the meeting. It is 630. We've been having our chat ahead of time with our presenter this evening, Mr. Charles Alexander from Brownsville, and I'll let him further introduce himself and we'll start his program. Thank you everyone for joining us. Okay. Um, I'm Charles Alexander. I live in Brownsville and I am a wildlife artist. I am a naturalist and I am a writer of both I'm I'm a writer of science fiction and nonfiction. And um I'm always interested in the relationship between man and the natural world. And here in the valley is a fascinating place to study that because we have urban parrots nesting in office parks and roosting in, over soccer games and um you know, you see a thousand parakeets on the wires over Whataburger. So there's this fascinating sort of interface between man and nature going on here. And so I've, I've taken it upon myself to study the urban wildlife of the valley, especially the parrots, because as I'll show you in my presentation, I've been interested uh, in parrots since I was a, a young child, um, really focused on starting with one species painted by John James Audubon. Carolina parakeet. And when I say I'm a naturalist, that means that I go out into nature and I make observations and I write those down. I document what I see and try to get some kind of empirical evidence of what I see. And then as an artist, I'm taking what I see and interpreting that uh, into artworks, into oil paintings and pastel. Uh, and also weaving that into stories weaving uh, what I've learned into stories, whether I'm writing about a Carolina parakeet in the 19th century as a novel, a fictional story, or whether I'm writing about uh, the parakeets of McAllen, Hope and Glory, which I'll show you, um, or the parrots nesting in a bank in Brownsville. Uh, all of these um, different things, uh, different stories are what I do every day. And I wouldn't want to trade places with anyone, really. So do you want me to start? Yep. You okay. should be able to share now. Okay. I'm sharing screen. Can you see it? Yep. Okay, you see the uh, parrots there? Okay, let's get going. I'm Charles Alexander. And I am a wildlife artist, as I said. Let me get this going. Um, I, this is an oil painting of lioness uh, reflection that I did based on research in the Serengeti National Park. Part of my life as an artist naturalist has been spent in East Africa where I've researched the Great Migration and its predators. Um, since I was a, a kid, I've been really interested in the Carolina parakeet, which is now extinct. Now, this is the Grand Champion National Cypress in West Feliciana Parish, Louisiana, near Bayou Sarah. And in 1825, John James Audubon painted this masterpiece of Carolina parakeets eating cockleburs. And this uh, was fascinating to me as a child. Uh, my grandmother gave me a book of Audubon's birds. I'd heard about dinosaurs being extinct, but the idea of a parrot living in the woods near my home or in the swamps that I knew growing up uh, was almost as if someone had just left the room. I couldn't process that this had happened so recently. Why was I not able to see them? I, so I became fascinated with this painting. Now this is the original painting that was done in 1825 by Audubon. This is at the New York Historical Society. I also journeyed to places where Audubon um, had traveled and worked. And this is Beechwood's Plantation in West Feliciana Parish, Louisiana. And this is the place where Audubon painted the Carolina parakeet in 1825. And I wanted to do the same. I wanted to paint a Carolina parakeet painting myself. But Audubon killed all the birds that he, he painted and he pinned them onto a board. And he would um, he would paint from his dead specimens. But I can't do that. We don't, I can't shoot birds that I want to paint. I can photograph them, but they're no living Carolina parakeet. So I thought if I studied uh, dead specimens, 
I could learn enough about the Carolina parakeet to maybe try doing a painting. So here I am. This was in 1995, a long time ago, at the Chicago Field Museum. And I have in the far background Carolina parakeets, and there perched on my hand is a passenger pigeon. There's an ivory-billed woodpecker in the foreground, and there are Bachman's warblers in the tray by the window. Those are all species that are most uh, likely extinct, except maybe the ivory-billed, some people think, still exists, but it's also probably extinct. These are Carolina parakeets collected in the late 19th century, and so I would collect data on their, from their leg tags, their specimen tags. Most of these were shot in Florida, and uh, but you see they're very uh, they're study skin, so they're kind of in a cylindrical, uh, uh, dead, kind of frozen stance without their wings showing. I, I couldn't even learn about how their wings, the, what their wings look like, the colors in their wings. These are green parakeets uh, in the foreground at the LSU Museum of Natural Science, Department of Ornithology. Carolina parakeets in the background was measuring the specimens, comparing the size of the Carolina extinct to the green parakeet. So by that time, I was already starting to think maybe if I studied green parakeets from life, I could somehow transpose them into a painting. First attempt to really study wild parakeets was to go down to the Amazon rainforest. And that wasn't really that successful because the parakeets I studied there gathering at clay licks along the Rio Napo in Ecuador, they would gather at the clay lick, which was pretty far away uh, for the camera that I had at the time. Then they would just fly off over the forest, just little black X's in the sky. And this was shortly after I'd gotten mugged by a park guard of the Yasuni National Park, uh, who kind of um, bashed some of my equipment. So I thought, well, I, I, I'm at a total loss here. I, I, I haven't got any template. I haven't got any wild parakeets that can help me study these birds to bring them to life. So I was juried into an exhibition in San Francisco, um, and it was in honor of the 50th anniversary of the founding of the United Nations. It was sponsored by the Natural World Museum and the World United Nations World Environment Program. I had three paintings in that show. It also featured a retrospective of paintings by probably one of the most famous living wildlife artists, and that was Robert Bateman. That's him and his wife, Birgit, and me uh, at the exhibition. I had three paintings in the show, including this little pastel. Uh, this is a detail from a much larger painting of a little uh, mountain gorilla whose hand had been caught in a snare, and he'd lost his hand. All of the paintings in the exhibition had an environmental theme. So I wrote to Mark Bittner, the author of The Wild Parrots of Telegraph Hill, and I told him that I had this idea of observing closely related species of the Carolina parakeet and maybe bringing it to life in a, uh, in a painting. And he thought that was a great idea and invited me up to Telegraph Hill. Uh, he was the author of a, of a well-known book, The Wild Parrots of Telegraph Hill, based in San Francisco, and also a film based on the book, The Wild Parrots of Telegraph Hill, which was an award-winning film. I spent about an hour with Mark and his famous parakeets. They were cherry-headed conures or parakeets. Conure is really the pet trade name for parakeet, and of course parakeets are just small parrots with long tail. I spent about an hour with them, but it was really ultimately unsatisfying when they flew off. Uh, I didn't have enough time. It really left me hungry for more. And I didn't know at that time that a few years later I'd be coming to the valley, coming to the Gladys Porter Zoo. This is uh, me in 2009 with one of the giant Galapagos tortoises, 100-year-old Galapagos tortoises at the Gladys Porter Zoo. I had painted, uh, this is a photograph of the Gentink diker antelope, which was one of the rarest animals in the world. The Gladys Porter Zoo at that time had the only specimen in captivity. So I came to study this animal and I did a painting for the zoo. Uh, and I did many paintings for the zoo. This is an African leopard that I painted that was auctioned in 2012. Um, these were all fundraiser paintings for the zoo. And I would stay at the um, zoo director's place, Camp Lula Sam's, which is uh, 100 acres of tomaleep and thorn scrub that is on the outskirts of Brownsville. So every year I would come back and I would stay a little longer and I would, and then I discovered that 
there was this amazing population of wild parrots in the valley, and it was just astonishing to me, considering that I had only spent an hour with the wild parrots of Te Telegraph Hill. Here were, you know, hundreds and hundreds of green parakeets over 10th Street in McAllen. This is uh, parakeets going to roost uh, on Violet Street at 10th. There was a little pair of green parakeets uh, who were trying to start a nest in a palm log over 10th Street. And I was when I took this photograph, I was literally standing in the middle of the street. And this was my dream. Now, I could easily take that photograph and using my specimen research, begin to transform that into a recreation of an extinct species of Carolina. But then I started getting really fascinated by the green par parakeets themselves. And they have, um, it, the, the green parakeet is Sitacara holochloris, and there are several different populations. The nominate race goes from South Texas, and then there's two, dis two dis distinct populations. Um, there's another Western Mexican race, and then there's a race on Socorro Island, which is that little dot on the right, lower right beneath Baja, California. And then at the very bottom, there's another race. And this is a bird that is now considered native to the United States by Texas Parks and Wildlife, along with the red crowned parrot. So here I was on 10th Street, suddenly confronted with hundreds and hundreds of parakeets. And everything they did really echoed a lot of the historical literature that I had read about the Carolina parakeet. So there was this whole dialogue going on in my mind between the past and the present. People often say that the green parakeet, you know, oh yes, you're studying parakeets. They think I mean a budgie. So I included this slide to show you that a budgie is a par also called a parakeet, and it's from Australia, and it's sold at PetSmart, and they're much, much smaller than a green parakeet, as you can see. This was a little blue par little green uh, little parakeet that was lost, a blue one, and uh, he w was attracted by the sound of the green parakeets in McAllen going to roost, and he tried to join up with them, but they weren't very nice to him, and he disappeared the next day after really cold rain. They don't little budgies don't do well in cold rain. They come from the desert, Australia. Now here's a monk parakeet, as I said earlier. People often tell me that. Oh, yes, we have parakeets in, in Austin. We have parakeets in New York City. I have them in Brooklyn. Well, they're talking about monk parakeets, which are an introduced species from South America, and they make these huge stick nests. I've seen them occasionally on the wires over 10th Street with the green parakeets looking kind of like they were insulted by their presence. They never really took to them. But occasionally I would see a monk. But we only have those at Hidalgo, Texas, here in South Texas. So. This initial phase of my research uh, 10 years ago, I was going out every day to McAllen and I was seeing parakeets. This is uh, perched on an S at a phone store, uh, congregating on the fountains at Lowe's Plaza. If you look in the lower right, uh, you'll see a mitered parakeet. I saw a whole family of mitered parakeets that were uh, not native. They were uh, escapees from captivity and they had babies. And so this, is uh, green parakeets eating in aqua berries, and it was right there at HEB next to gas pumps, which was amazing to me because it kind of reminded me of Audubon's composition of Carolina parakeets eating cockleburs, and I was beginning to get closer to realizing my dream. But, and this is the little pair uh, in their cozy penthouse over the street on 10th Street, and every day I was learning something new, and then. March the 30th, 2012, ten, almost 10 years ago, a tremendous hailstorm hit McAllen. The next day, I went out there and found that all along 10th Street, the businesses and buildings there looked like they'd been strafed by machine gun fire. And very soon, I began to see them, the green parakeets that I had been so in love with, uh, strewn about on the street, people running over them, paying no attention. Uh, and so and they looked like they'd been hit with a hammer, which in essence they had the, the ice, the huge hail, uh, which had formed six foot drifts down 10th Street. They had melting rivers of ice and apartment buildings on fire. Um, there were whole car dealerships totaled. 
and lots of my little green parakeets killed, and I gathered them up, uh, lined them up sort of like the Carolina parakeets that you see in the in the trays in the museum, and uh, I, I put I gathered them up so they wouldn't be uh, run over anymore. And so it was it was sort of a, a death by fire and ice, um, and and it was it was really traumatic situation, and. I gathered the only birds that I found alive on the ground after the hail were male great-tailed grackles, which, as you know, are very tenacious birds. I gathered some up, took them back to Camp Lula Sands, and the zoo director and his wife helped me rehab some of them, and we let them go back in McAllen. And my little pair of green parakeets and their palm log, the, the palm was totally destroyed by the, by the ice, but the parakeets were in their little penthouse, and they survived okay. A couple of days later, I saw a, precisely 102 parrot, parakeets um, over the wires of Waterburger. So I knew that some had survived. Uh, it, it took them unawares, you know, uh, when they were on their roost. I was really amazed that they had survived, but they had. So it, it, based on one of my earlier slides, you could see that Audubon was following Carolina parakeets in the virgin cypress swamps of West Feliciana Parish. and I found myself following green parakeets at Whataburger, which was really an uh, incredible uh, thing to consider that these birds lived in the urban environment by hundreds. After the hail, I switched my sight to this Sacred Hearts Church in Brownsville, and the birds were gathering there every night. They had made an urban clay lick out of the church, nibbling on the clay bricks. I started to get an idea of the food plants that they eat. Here's a parakeet eating an orchid tree blossom. They were gathering on the wild olive, the anaquahita. This is in the parking lot of the church in Brownsville and uh, right near a bank. And the parakeets were diving off of the uh, roof of the church. They were having a big roost rally. That was my name for it having a good time uh, gathering and having a big party and jamboree before they went to roost every night. And right adjacent, there was a bank, and they were checking out the letters. Um, a year after um, a year after the hailstorm, I got a report that there were two yellow parakeets in McAllen flying around, and I thought, well, they must mean yellow budgies. They must mean Latino budgies. People often confuse parakeets for budgies, the green parakeets for budgies. And so, you know, after the hail, I had noticed that uh, there were a lot of parakeets in the population that had a lot of yellow markings, including this family, which had yellow dots all over them. And here's, as I showed you, uh, the, this one with the yellow neck and then yellow sparkles all over. And then one day after I got this report, I went down 10th Street, and here they came, this family of green parakeets, two parents and a green sibling with two yellow green parakeets. They landed at the fountain at Lowe's Plaza uh, and just behaved like all the rest, except they, had yellow, they, had, they were bright yellow with red eyes, so they were true mutations. The male great-tailed grackles took exception to the parakeets coming to drink at the fountain, and they would try to chase them away. But as more and more parakeets came to the fountain, they would they would always fly off. Here are the Latinos uh, being fed by their parents, and Latino simply means that they do not have the pigment blue in their feathers, so you have to have blue and yellow to make green. So they don't have blue pigment because of a mutation, and they only show yellow. They were extraordinarily beautiful, and I was just so uh, thrilled to be able to see them every day and know that this was this particular family. I knew what they were doing because of the extraordinary uh, color, the babies, so I could follow them and I could learn about their lives. Now, one other uh, family that showed up while I was studying the Latinos was this mitered parakeet. He was the only survivor, the middle bird there you see on the fountain. He was the only survivor of the family uh, of, of mitered parakeets before the hail. He, met, he paired up with a little red-throated parakeet, which is uh, Sitacara rubitorquis, which is another a different species 
related to the green parakeet. They have these huge hybrid babies, and you can see one flying in the background there. So I settled in to follow these birds every day, and they would often go to this vacant lot where they were, there was this huge grove of anaqua trees and palms and hackberries, and nobody was there to bother the birds. And so they would gather there and, and feed on all the food that was available to them there. And then one day I showed up and I found this. They're, they were knocking everything down. Everything was all of the old anaqua trees. And they were very old. All of the palms, all of the hackberries, everything, all of the places I photographed and observed the birds over weeks, were, 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 it was all level. I heard some terrible screams and I was drawn to this milk crate. The construction crew had found two little fox squirrels that had fallen from a nest that they'd knocked down and they were poking them with sticks. And uh, I convinced them to let me have them and I took them to a wildlife rehab lady in, in uh, Edinburgh. So as time went on, uh, soon after the secret garden, as I call it, was leveled, hope and glory, as I named them, were starting to get weaned by their parents, and that meant no. No meant no, and they were throwing fits because they weren't being fed by their parents anymore. And the parents were very protective of them. Here's a little uh, friend friendly little young bird trying to say hello and the parents trying to drive them away from their precious babies. Here's hope and glory on the rim of the fountain. And it was just such an amazing experience to see them every day. And when they would fly in and land, it just really almost didn't seem real. This is a family going to roost at the end of the day. And the valley, as you know, has these magnificent sunsets. Unfortunately, in in early November of 2013, a cold norther blew into the valley, and I was very worried about the family. I called them the Nova family, and I didn't know how the parrots would fare when this brutal cold weather blew in. I'd never really uh, followed them during uh, the winter cold. Unfortunately, I don't know if it was because of the clearing of the habitat of the secret garden and all the food plants that were lost. I wasn't really sure if it was a combination of that or the, uh, maybe she was a very young bird, but Glory um, became ill. And one night when all of the parakeets flew off of the wires over 10th Street, they had sighted a raptor. She tried to follow, but every wing beat just brought her closer to the ground and she fell into the street. I ran out and I, I saved her um, from the traffic. I put her in my coat and then I took her and, and put her in a carrier. And I took her to the same rehab lady in Edinburgh who had taken the squirrels. Unfortunately, she did not survive. So I went back and soon, all of, I, this is what was left of the secret garden where the parrots had spent so much time, where I'd spent so much of the day watching the parrots feeding so idyllically in this in this old trees. And then they started building a strip center, of course, with a phone store and um, all the other things that you see in, in these uh, little strip centers, which are everywhere, little plazas. And this is that, the plaza now. Those are one, the, all that remains of the big old Inaqua trees. So after Glory died, you know, going back home at night from McAllen uh, after uh, following the family, it was it was really sad, uh, hard to take sometimes going back home and thinking about everything I'd seen and wondering about what, what, what would happen next. So Hope was alive, and she was by herself. She didn't have her sibling, and they were very, very close. So she was trying to find her way among all the other green parakeets. And she was very down for a while. I think that was, I don't want to anthropomorphize her, uh, but she really was grieving, I think, for a period and seemed lost without her sibling. But fortunately, the, the green parakeets are very tactile, and the parents are extraordinarily devoted to the young ones. And they're very, very close. And really, this became the theme of the whole story for me, you know, even though uh, we have life, and we have togetherness, and we have a family. It's only here for a brief moment, and then it's gone. And so I, I was very dedicated to being there every day to, to document what I could. 
this is Hope uh, in a crepe myrtle eating the berries. So I was documenting everything they were eating. One day in McAllen, I came upon these parakeets, just a tree full of them. They were There was fluff flying out of the tree, this golden fluff. And I was wondering, what are they doing? And they were making these sounds, that flocking noises, just chattering away. And it, they were very eager to get at this food. I found out that they were eating wasp galls, which are growing underneath the live oak leaves, and little puff balls. And these contain the insect larva of a certain kind of wasp. And so I wrote a paper that was my very first science paper that was ever published in the Journal for Texas Ornithology. That was a new discovery. Green parakeets also eat acorns. They love acorns and live oaks. And um, Red, red crown parrots, too. So here's Hope uh, on the wires over the street coming to the fountains soon after Glory's death. And she seemed to be doing okay. She was much more of a mama and daddy's girl than the other bird. She was always sticking to her parents. I don't know if that had anything to do with Glory's demise because at one time she disappeared for two days and didn't show back up. But Hope would never leave her parents. She was always with them at all times. In early 2014, the word got out there, there was this yellow bird, and there were a lot of birders coming to McAllen to the fountains to see uh, what they called Hope. Or well, I had named her Hope, and people started calling her Esperanza, which is Spanish for Hope. And so you'd see a flock of hundreds of green parakeets, and there in the middle would be this one yellow one. And it was wonderful to know that I knew her a lot about her history. I knew that she had had a sibling who had died. I knew that her parents were devoted to her. I knew that she'd had a green sibling. I knew that they fed upon certain kind of plants and they frequented certain places. And uh, I just kept writing things down. I knew that Hope was yellow, of course, and I wondered if she was different from the others and if they would pick on her. But no, she could hold her own quite well uh, among the other greens. She could give as good as she got. This is a, a Harris's hawk uh, uh, trying to snag a green parakeet. This particular Harris hawk on 10th Street had a, a leg that stuck straight out, was paralyzed. The green parakeets knew that somehow there was something wrong with him, and they, they really uh, literally flew circles around him. Here's a couple of Harris's hawks in the Coles parking lot in McAllen. And uh, trying to, I've seen Harris's hawk hit the parakeets on a roost, but I've never seen them get one. And in the winter time, you have this extraordinary uh, just congregation, aggregation of birds on 10th and Nolani. You have mass numbers of grackles, just literally tens of thousands at HEB uh, and at 10th and Trenton, the, and hundreds and hundreds of green parakeets going to roost right with the uh, great tailed grackles. You have bronze cowbirds, you have starlings. Uh, here's Hope going to roost in one of the little live oaks at Logan's Roadhouse. And then the grackles would settle down on top of that, and they were hair trigger in their response to any disturbance. And I think the parakeets were benefiting from the grackles being so alert. Here's a pair of parakeets checking out red lobster. Does that look like a good nesting cavity? No, I don't think so. Um, so here you have these uh, amazing, um, this black tide of grackles rolling in at dusk. And unlike the green parakeets that bunch together in little family units, the grackles have to be spaced out just so. So it reminded me of a Bach fugue or some kind of music, the way that they would arrange themselves on the wires. And they would settle down for the night in vast numbers at HEB, at Target, uh, Best Buy, Coles. And the parakeets, here they are over Logan's Roadhouse coming down to uh, settle in the little live oaks. And here's Hope in a live oak right in the middle of a HEB parking lot near the gas pumps. Her parents on either side of her, and she looked like a bright candle there. You could see her from quite a long ways. This was at Christmas time. Shoppers going everywhere and the parakeets roosting in the little live oaks right over people's heads, and people really not paying much attention. I often uh, spent the night out there to see what would happen in the middle of the night at the roost, and they would often be disturbed in the night by an unseen presence. I could never really decide what it was. They would fly from HEB to Target to Coles, then back again and settle in. It was somewhat of a restless sleep. As dawn came, they would spiral up into the sky 
and they would disperse uh, and just vanish like a wisp of smoke. Sometimes hope would vanish for up to two weeks, and I thought she was never coming back. Without her, I couldn't tell her parents apart from the other parakeets in the mass hundreds. But here she is. She came back after a two-week disappearance, and she was at the bank at um, Milana at 10th Street. There was a peregrine falcon perched on a ledge way above on the bank building. And so here she came, and I learned to have faith in their ability to survive. In late 2014, I had to go back to Tennessee for my sister's wedding. In, uh, sister's wedding. I went back to Tennessee where I'd grown up, and I went to my sister's wedding in Kentucky, and back to the land of the Carolina parakeet. And I had to leave Hope. Hope had been stalked by people who wanted to capture her for the pet trade. In fact, I had heard that both Hope and Glory had been ordered by a collector of parrots in North Carolina. Uh, I had gotten an ordinance passed. I'd gone to the city council, and I had spoken to them, so I got an ordinance passed uh, protecting all parrots in McAllen, within McAllen city limits, including green parakeets, red crown parrots, any kind of parrots, $500 fine for disturbing their nests or capturing or trying to sell any kind of parrot. Here she is on a, what I would call a nuptial flight. Now, by that I mean, now when the here we have the mitered parakeet to the right, and he is pursuing green parakeets after his little red-throated mate had died. And he successfully paired up with a green parakeet after his red-throated mate had died. And this was a bird who escaped from captivity. He had a leg band on on his leg. Uh, you can see the leg band there on his left left leg. He would bump up against his intended mate as they were circling and circling and circling at a high rate of speed over uh, the Fountain Plaza. And I saw Hope doing the same thing. That was my very last uh, sighting of her. I went off to Kentucky, and when I came back to the valley, she was seen no more. The last sighting I had of the mitered conure, mitered parakeet, which I called the ultimate survivor, was in the fall of 2015 with a flock of green parakeets eating crepe myrtle uh, dried berries in the uh, parking lot of Coles on 10th Street in McAllen. So I wrote all this down, everything as I explained earlier, I write everything straight from nature and what my response is to it and what's going on. Eventually, in the fall of 2015, uh, this house came available right around the corner from Lula Sam's. And I moved in there, and I have my studio there. I started, um, I got word of a place, of one of these plazas, of which there are hundreds, where red-crowned parrots and green parakeets were nesting side by side. So every morning, I would leave my house uh, early in the morning, which I still do every day. This is a, a painting that I'm working on now. Uh, which is an, this is an underpainting. I do an extensive underpainting and drawing. This is of wildebeest crossing at the Mara River with zebras and in Kenya. And so I have my studio, and every day I go off. Uh, I live between two wildlife refuges in kind of a secret location in Brownsville. I go down the road here between the wildlife refuges. I have to go out into the urban jungle to see the parrots. I go to a plaza. Uh, that you would probably never notice driving by. And suddenly I'm there and I see parrots. Here's green parakeets who are gathered on a column on the bank. The bank has these styrofoam columns all across the front and down the sides. And the parrots have discovered that you can make a nice hole in those. Here are red crown parrots in one of the styrofoam columns. I was astonished when I saw all this. And this is Fuego and Fia, who have become my touchstone red crown parrots that I've followed the most. This uh, breeding season, which is starting now, will be my fifth year documenting everything they do during the breeding season. Uh, I have documented every baby that they have fledged and the date of when they started mating, when, they, when the female started staying in the nest by herself. There's a whole tribe of red crown parrots that comes to this plaza. I've seen up to 90 at one time. And I think they may all be related. This is a range map of the endangered red crown parrot, which is endangered by vast habitat loss and also it's victimized by the pet trade. 
And you can see that the red uh, map there shows that the parrot come up pretty close to Brownsville. Now they're considered native uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife. So I go to the plaza every day and there's a world of things going on right under people's noses. And many parrots gather there uh, to bring the next generation into being. And I've uh, documented over 100 species, up to 100 species of birds. And there's a glimpse of one of my journals. I date everything and I write it all down. There were kitties living in the parking lot who were beguiling me, trying to convince me to bring them home. This is Sombra who showed up one day. I called her my shadow, me Sombra, and she was following me. She was very thin and she was being fed outside the Mexican cafe at the plaza. And she was very pitiful and she had decided I was the one. So of course I couldn't turn her down. Now she lives here with me at home. This is Fuego and Fia in the parking lot in a palm, eating palm fruits over the park, of, over the car, parked cars at the Mexican cafe. So you wouldn't notice uh, a lot of people walking by, they see this little tree here, this little live oak on an island in the middle of the parking lot. They don't notice that what's up there on the top is a pair of endangered red crowned parrots. There's parakeets, red crowned parrots, hooded orioles, mockingbirds, um, incredible uh, just explosion of life going on. And every bird has a story and it's all happening uh, all the time. So that's the, this air, this little office park has been my control sort of study of what happens in the urban jungle. This is the Inca dove uh, flashing its uh, beautiful tail. Overhead during migration, there's broad winged hawks. There's hundreds of broad winged hawks on this particular occasion uh, migrating with turkey vultures. So I wrote that down. I see migrating pelicans in the palms in the office park. There are bats who come out. Um, early in the morning. I see them flitting around at dusk. And of course, more kitties and we have Muscovy ducks and there was a blue cat named Sheba and a little Manx cat with no tail. And this was during the height of lockdown and all of this stuff was going on. There were cats mingling with ducks and parrots right over my head. And one time the police came through there and they were looking at me, talking to the cats and talking to the ducks. I think they thought I was kind of a lunatic and they left me alone. I took those two kitties home too, so I have all three of them now with me. And I've seen lots of baby doves on the ground, so no cats are getting the birds anymore. So now let's talk a little bit about Texas. Uh, while I'm at the um, plaza, I often wonder what this place must have been like, this place where I spent so much time in the parking lot. What was it like 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 500 years ago? So the land beneath the plaza pavement has changed hands many times. I mean, once jaguars roamed the South Texas bushlands and the native tribes wrested a living from an unforgiving land. And by the mid 18th century, Spanish land grants and Spanish missions had taken hold, destroying and assimilating increasingly hostile native cultures. The Spanish territory of Nuevo Santander, established by the Spanish crown in 1746, subsumed the lower Rio Grande region, stretching from uh, present-day Corpus to lands far south of the Rio Grande. And it was renamed Tamaulipas after Mexico's independence from Spain in 1810. And those territorial claims were disputed during the Texas Revolution, a conflict that led to the death of my family forebear, David Crockett of Tennessee, who was killed at the hour my mother is a descendant of the Crockett's and the Pattons who lived in the uh, northeast, I mean, northwest uh, Tennessee uh, near Rilfoot Lake. Uh, so Texas became a state in 1845 following the U.S. annexation of the Independent Republic of Texas. And then the Texas-Mexico border um, was finally set at the Rio Grande by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848. And also, as you know, this was a cattle kingdom, and uh, it was uh, the Chisholm Trail, the, the, the classic Old West. And as more and more people came to the valley, they cleared the brushlands that were teeming with life. And we had jaguars, we still have ocelots, um, so much life. They replaced uh, the natural world with the citrus groves and agriculture, it became known as the Happy Valley. And it was famous for citrus being shipped all over 
and agriculture and sunshine. And uh, along with all that sunshine, you had the demise of uh, species like the jaguar in the valley. It's the last jaguar that was killed in 1946 in San Benito, which is right close to where I live, and it's uh, strung up, strung up like uh, an outlaw. And that was the last known jaguar here in the valley. So this, you have that replaced all of that brushland and the land of the jaguar. You have uh, this urban environment, densely urbanized. And yet, in the middle of it all, you have endangered red crown parrots perched on power lines, ready to bring the next generation into being. Green parakeets doing the same, excavating a nest out of the styrofoam columns at the plaza. And so let me tell you a little bit about the plaza. It's the only plaza I know where red crown parrots and parakeets are nesting side by side with woodpeckers and muscovy ducks. But there's plazas everywhere across the valley. There's the Bootjack Plaza, Winwood Plaza, Mesquite Plaza, Central Village Plaza, Wild Rose Plaza, 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 Plaza. There's a hundred plazas in Brownsville on a day's an afternoon's drive. I've driven around and tried to document them all. There's only one other plaza that I know of in Brownsville where parrots are nesting. Those are green parakeets at a medical plaza. And there's a giant, I believe it's an aqua tree, huge old aqua cluster there. But there's only one plaza where you can see the red crown parrots nesting with the parakeets side by side. And I've come to know these birds as individuals. So what you have here in this slide is that you have Carlotta and Flash on the top left. And then going around clockwise, you have Venus and Vulcan. And then in flight, you have Fuego and Fia. And then there's the regal pair, Passion Blaze, and their nest on the east side of the building. And then there's the comical young pair, Dante and Pilar, who I first saw show up at the plaza as a young and inexperienced pair who just wanted to fuss and fight with all the others. And I think they were learning how to be parents because the next year they were successful in raising a baby. The golden-fronted woodpeckers that nest there and also excavate the columns take exception to the proximity of red crown parrots nose being nosy at their nest and will chase them away. We have muscovy ducks, which are cavity nesters and nesting in the holes. And come springtime, about this time of year, the, the light is getting, the days are getting longer, the hormones are rising. Here you have Fuego and Fia perched on a, on a light pole, pole sitting and trying to wear down Carlotta and Flash and drive them away from the most coveted, most coveted uh, hole at the top of column four. And so they'll fight and pull feathers and feathers will be flying and it's just a tremendous noise. And of course, people are walking into the bank paying no attention whatsoever. And in 2019, Fuego and Fia were successful in routing Carlotta and Flash, who were a pretty formidable pair. And they were able to take over the, co the coveted hole at the top of column four. That's Fuego's very winded after having a big fight with Flash. And so about this time a little, uh, in, in March, uh, late February, especially in March, they'll start mating. There's a picture of Fuego and Fia. This is really the beginning of it all when they, they're touching and they're mating. Uh, and they're, they continue to mate in March. And uh, here is the height of lockdown during the pandemic. And people were showing up to get their remote paychecks from ladies wearing masks and gloves. And the parrots were uh, mating right over their heads and no one ever noticed. Now, at the end of March, uh, the females will stay in the hole, and the male will say goodnight, and he'll fly off to Oliveda Park with the other males, and they will roost in the park, but leave the females in their holes. So here's Fia, and she has decided that this is the night she's going to start sitting, and she does not leave her eggs. Uh, the males are in Fuego, they go off to the park, and they roost in the tall eucalyptus. But early in the morning, He'll come back to the plaza, and I'm there at first lighting. I'm waiting, and she's waiting. And he'll start circling the parking lot, making this you know, sort of eerie call, wheel, wheel. And she'll pop out of the hole, and she'll fly out to the street, and he'll feed her. He'll leap over her, and this is part of their ritual. Uh, as time goes on, he'll start leaping over, and he'll start reaching out for her with his foot. And But once she's done her full clutch. She doesn't want to do that anymore. She'll discourage him. 
and sometimes he'll whine and cry. And immediately after getting fed, the female will fly straight back to the hole and dive in just in the blink of an eye, go right back to her eggs. Now, this is a shot of Fuego bringing a palm fruit to Fia in the nest. That's one of the only examples I've discovered uh, and documented of the male birds actually bringing fruit to the female rather than regurgitation as a means of feeding her. So there's uh, some different palm fruits, the queen palm and date palm. And so as time goes on, he'll come out, he'll come in the morning and feed her. And then as the eggs hatch, which they hatch, um, they hatch after 28 days and around the time of John James Audubon's birthday, which is a good way to remember it, April the 26th. In late April, the babies start hatching. Then the female will fly off. When he arrives in the morning, she'll fly off with him, and they will um, come back and feed the babies together. But before they go to the nest, they always go to the live oaks, and they eat bark. And I'm, it's very interesting how they do this. They, when they fly back from a feeding foray, they go straight to the live oak, and they crunch up the bark of the live oak. Then they go to feed the babies. There's a uh, mesquite growing in the parking lot. Uh, they sort of have a vast garden uh, cultivated really for their use everywhere across the urban environment. And these uh, mesquite pods are very rich in sugars and they're very nutritious for growing babies. So this is Fuego and Fia's very first fledging that I documented in 2018, the very first baby of that clutch in 2018 that fledged. Now, fledging with red crown parrots is a one-shot deal. They leap out of the nest and they have to make it fly off for their parents. If they don't, they're not going back in. In 2019, here they are at their favorite spot on the top of column four, and there is Flint up in the upper left. I named these babies since Fuego and Fia. I named all the babies with an F. And this is Flint, and he uh, fell out of the nest. He didn't make it on the fledging. He was actually pushed out of the nest, playing around with the siblings, and he was hanging by one toe, and his siblings bit his toe, and he fell. And the siblings just watched him fall. He fell to a roof over the bank. And so we had to get him because there were a lot of ants up there. It was very hot. And uh, we took him to the zoo, and he was fed, and he was checked out to see if he had any broken bones because he fell four stories. There's, there wasn't a ladder in Brownsville high enough to return to his nest. The fire, then the fire brigade never showed up, even though said they would. We fed him the wild foods and we tried to strengthen him in an outdoor aviary off exhibit. We returned him to the plaza to show him his parents. He would call to them, they would call. Uh, he would call to them, they would call to him. They knew that this was their baby. So um, eventually, uh, after one failed attempt, he was, I held the cat carrier up and, and unzipped it, and he was able to fly off with his parents and return to the wild. He knew he was a parrot. He wasn't born in captivity. He wasn't captive bred. He was bred in a hole four stories up with his siblings. He knew he was a parrot, and he was able to return to the wild. Now, in 2019, Fuego and Fia's nest failed in early May when they would have babies in the hall. And I wasn't sure what happened. I just know that all of a sudden they stopped going to the nest. And what they did on that particular day was very interesting. They sat in a live oak and they just sat like this in the morning and through the afternoon. Parrots go and doze in the heat of the day, but I'd never seen them doze all day in the parking lot. They always leave. But after their babies died, they I think they were grieving. They were very, very upset, and they just sat like this all day. And there was a man who came close to them and was asking, "Hey, you think you know you, how much can you get for one of these?" And I just asked him, "Please step away." And he was arguing with me, but eventually he left. He he asked me, "Are you here all the time?" And I said, "Yes, I'm. I'm here all the time. I never leave." Now here's an example of the red crowned parrots eating the wasp galls. Well, this is a different species of wasp gall from the ones that I wrote the paper on. So I'm going to write a paper about this red crown parrot eating this particular kind of gall. You can see these are an immune response that the tree itself makes to the deposition of wasp eggs underneath the leaves. So it's full of moisture and it's 
got little crunchy protein larvae in there. So you can see these. I'm sure you're all familiar with these little round shapes under our live oak leaves. The parrots love them. The parakeets eat them too. So here we have caution speed bumps ahead, which, you know, I've included this picture to, you know, to think about the uncertain future of species like, like the red crowned parrot, so endangered and so vulnerable in the urban environment. These palms where they're perched here, uh, because of a craze now in the valley to turn all palms into pineapples, all of those fronds that you see there were trimmed and the palm is standing there with just sprigs at the top for no reason. Um, there's a craze now to make all palms look like pineapples and there's of course no place for bats and no fruit. So in the winter time, the parrots are off in winter flocks and I visit the plaza. Sometimes I see them, sometimes I don't. They're off in huge winter flocks traveling around trying to find the best food and the babies from that year are learning to be wild red crowned parrots. Here they are in an aqua tree in there living wild and free and together and that's where they belong and this is their birthright and I I so enjoy seeing that they have freedom of choice and so just my work continues I, I show up every day I continue with the red crowns I continue with the parakeets in the lower left there you see star who was a parakeet that emerged in 2021 uh, and she had yellow wings and yellow tail and there's a CC pigeon there, the, I call him CC because he's cinnamon and cream, and he's shown up. He's been there for years. There's hundreds of parakeets there, and there in the upper right, you see a family of parakeets with five babies. Now, I want to mention that the green parakeets have a totally different fledging from the red crowns. Their babies will fly out of the nest, land in a palm or an oak with the parents right beside them. Then they'll fly back up to the hole and pop in. And all of them will pop in like a family of little feathered meerkats and huddle together in there. And so uh, it's a totally different way from the red crown parrots. So unlocking the mysteries of, of green parakeet nesting and mating has been a tremendous opportunity at the plaza. This is Willow, uh, who's a green parakeet with a paralyzed foot. And his foot can't close. And he can't perch with that, that right foot. You see it there with his toes sticking out. So I know that's him. So I can tell uh, over time what the family's doing. That's his little mate, Fern. And this past year, I documented them successfully fledging babies. Now, I don't have time to tell you the story of Candlewing, who was an extraordinary yellow uh, red crowned parrot that suddenly appeared in Westlaco in 2018. I named him Candlewing because he had these red candles on his wings that were complete with little candle flames. So as I said earlier, I'm journaling and writing everything down and um, the truth of nature going straight onto the page. And what is my response? And it's so important, I feel, to write everything down, not only the facts, the empirical evidence of what I'm seeing, but my response to nature, my feelings about it, and, and what it, how it changes me and the way I think. So this is Mark Catesby's painting of the Carolina parakeet, one of the very first images ever created of that lost species. And we don't know what happened. You know, we don't know how they nested. We've lost the opportunity to learn about these birds. And so that's what I'm doing. I'm taking the opportunity every day to try to learn as much as I can. And it's teaching me, it's informing my, my present and also the past. My connection with the past is very strong. I don't forget what's happened and what's come before. And I think it shapes the future because I'm passing this on to future generations who might read my work, who might learn about Hope and Glory or Fuego and Fia or some of the uh, wonderful birds that I'm able to privilege to be with every day. So that's my program and thank you for taking the time. If anyone wants to ask questions, I'm, I'm open to questions. Did you ever paint a parakeet? Yes, and I'm going to uh, include that in my book, um, and you'll see that. I've done quite a lot of work. So when, when I'm, I'm kind of saving some of that back for my publication. I want it to be a surprise. Any other, any other questions about Hope and Glory or, or the Carolina parakeet or red-crowned parrots or green parakeets?
Charles, do you ever document anything um, with video? Oh, yes, totally. And I wanted to put that in the program because I absolutely um, spend tremendous amount of time with a video camera mounted on a tripod. And I hope that one day I'll be savvy enough to include video because it, there's something about hearing them that changes you. In fact, uh, anytime I hear white noise or static or, or if I'm in a restaurant or something that has lots of loud music and I think I can hear parakeets in that. In white noise, I hear them. And they're just so a part of me now that I think I hear parrots if I hear white noise. So their voices are very important. Sometimes I've been transported by their voices um, in the plaza parking lot. There'll be dozens of red crown parrots. Their tri whole tribe showed up fighting and carrying on. And then the green parakeets are circling the parking lot, screaming and screaming. And it's like these ancient voices from, from prehistory that are transporting me to the origins of parrots. And it, 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 it has that power to be close to nature, to think about the connections between past and present future. And I think that this is available to all of us. We have a phone in our hand that gives us access to all human knowledge. So if you want to know about uh, where parrots originated, or you want to know about Gondwana origins of parrots, parrot evolution, if you want to know about Carolina parakeets, you can do some research um, on your phone, and that can start you dreaming. And maybe that'll start you writing. That'll start you observing. That's what I've done. You know, I spent my life dreaming as, as a child. That one painting by Audubon, you know, changed my life forever. So it's not all about the science. You know, we have to be dreamers too. We have to have the heart and, and to feel what uh, what we're seeing and how we respond. Because ultimately people, as they say, you know, it's been said so many times that people don't care, they're not gonna save anything. So I feel you've like gotten, it's so- Hi, you've gotten numerous uh, kudos and I think you have touched many hearts tonight. Um, Thank there you are a couple so of much. questions. Yes, um, okay. uh, there's a question about the parakeets fly west in the morning from McAllen where do you think they go? Okay. Um, I often wondered where Hope and her family went. And I got a message one time from this man called, who was an avatar, didn't know the true identity of the person. And uh, he said his name was Doc Holliday, which, you know, was from the OK Corral. And he said that he had a picture of hope and glory at their net where they were nesting, where, where they came from, with them sticking their heads out of the nest. And uh, that was in Alamo. So I figured that they were going back to their to that area. Um, it's really hard to know. I mean, uh, I wish I had known where they where they had been hatched, but I, I they would disappear like a wisp of smoke, and it wasn't possible. To, to find out, you know, I don't put any, I don't, I'm not authorized to put any kind of radio collars or tracking devices on them. Um, and I feel like I, I don't want anyone to do that to the parrots at the plaza because they trust and I don't want them to have their behavior altered by being caught and having to wear something they hate. I know they really hate a radio collar or a radio device. They, the other parrots will work at it until uh, it will it will be worked off. They they try to get it loose. Any you know they don't really. I mean that's just my idea. I mean I'm, I know science is important. Uh, I'm I've written science, but I like to see them untouched by human hands and to be free, and to be what they are. So we had an, another question in chat. Okay. Uh, what about uh what what effects did you see from the freeze? It delayed the nesting. Um, this year, the nesting, the babies were fledging toward the end of July when usually they're gone in early July from the plaza. It, it, I was wondering if they were ever going to get started. So what happened with the freeze was it really did delay the whole nesting season by a couple of three weeks. 
So that was the main effect that I saw. And of course, I was worried about them not having enough food. You know, I was seeing everything just dying. So it truly worried me. Uh, I have a long list of food plants and I was checking them off thinking, no, I don't see any of that. So I that was one of that was one of our last questions here is, could you mention again the various kinds of food preferred by the parrots? Okay, well, live oak acorns and the, the wasp galls that live underneath that are underneath the leaves of the live oaks, which are an insect food. Um, of course, the mesquite pods, uh, the, you often see them eating the flowers of the orchid tree. The parakeets are eating the wild olive flowers and fruit. Um, I've seen them eating royal ponciana. Um, and aqua berries are really big, mulberries, um, loquats, um, just so many different, different ones. Uh, I could go on all night about what they eat. In fact, I could do a whole PowerPoint on just their food and show you on video what they're eating. But it's all in the urban environment, and it's like their Garden of Eden. You know, they, they just have, you know, I call it the, uh, the uh, Home Depot savanna, that they're flying out there across the Home Depot savanna, and there's all these live oaks full of acorns, and there's mesquite just dripping with pods waiting to be picked. And hey, so Joseph? they figured this out. Yeah. Hmm? Joseph, did you see any more uh, questions or comments on the Facebook? Um, lots, mm -hmm. of, lots of comments saying they love the presentation. I don't see any questions over there. Okay. okay. Well, it's been wonderful. And I, I do wish you could take a few minutes to look at some of the kudos that everybody thinks is very excellent, wonderful, wonderful presentation, beautiful. You know, there's very positive comments and we oh, thank you so appreciate much. You. This has been one of our best programs. So we so okay. appreciate you, your efforts with, with Joseph backing you there to be <laughs> sure we could have this. So thank you oh, so much. So you're welcome and absolutely impossible without Joseph because he really made me at ease thinking this is going to happen, you know, because I don't, my first, Zoom went boom. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank and, you. Uh, oh, and we have one more. It's, it's, it's okay. excellent storyteller. And when does your, uh, let us know when your book comes out. So I email will. me and I'll I pass will. it on to everybody. Okay. Yes. Well, thank, thank you. you so and much. Um, we will move on to our business okay. meeting. And thank you for joining us this evening. Appreciate You're welcome. it so much. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Bye bye. 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 All right. We'll get a give everybody a couple of minutes to um, recoup and uh, get set for the business meeting. And I'm going to change my layout a little bit. There. All right. Okay. We're going to try and keep the business meeting pretty brief. Um, we had an excellent guest speaker. And uh, okay, there's the treasurer's reports that were attached and Gail is here, or at least I saw her earlier this evening. She's probably still here. Uh, if anyone has questions about the treasurer's reports um, and if you, you don't wanna take time now, you're always welcome to email her and ask her questions or join us at a board meeting. We can discuss those also. And I did mention that our $15 dues are due and for those that are in the new class, you paid the dues for this year with your class fees. So you don't have, we don't need to get another $15 from the new class members. Um, and otherwise, if uh, you're a um, regular member with us, the form is online. If you want to print it out and send it in, or you can pay online these days. And the minutes of the last, meeting are also attached for your review and I hope you look those over again if you had a chance to review those if you spot anything a misspelling of your name or something that didn't quite come across or or you don't understand um, we can uh, pass those comments on to Martha so she can make any needed corrections and otherwise we can consider those um, uh, approved as printed uh, next is our committee reports, uh, membership committee. I know 
Ronnie was there earlier, Ronnie Escarino. There he is, if he wants to speak up. Everybody, hope you're doing well. See everyone. Um, I'm going to really quickly share out my report. Hope you're able to see it. I hope the, that gray box of death isn't plaguing me still. Looks good okay? today. Hey. Let's see. Okay, so <clears throat> just reporting on how we're doing um, for the month of January. Um, things have continued in terms of active members. We have we still have 90 active members. Well, it's 115 um, that are working with us. Uh, 90 of them are active members and 25 are in training. Uh, that's uh, combined uh, from our 2021 and 2022 classes. And there are still <clears throat> Um, individuals from the 2021 that are uh, entering hours and are on their way to becoming initially certified. And so we would love for um, those remaining uh, to do just that. <clears throat> In that month, half of our 90 uh, members uh, log service or 80 hours through 24 unique service opportunities. So we have a uh, 50% uh, active rate uh, for our for our chapter. Um, so that's um, it's a good amount, and uh, of course, it can uh, it can uh, grow stronger. Uh, when it comes to our administrative activity breakdown, you can see right there our training classes. It's January; they've just started. Are comprising the bulk of um, what our board is working on, uh, along with the rest of their duties. Um, let's see. And so, in terms of the impact uh, the chapters had over January. Uh, there were 763.25 uh, total approved service hours. Uh, so that uh, equals 21,783 uh, and 15 cents uh, dollars worth of impact. So that's uh, pretty substantial. So thank you so much for your, your great work um, and um, looking forward to uh, reporting on February. Advanced training hours, 133 uh, hours of people of our members improving themselves. And you can see right there, those, those those initial training numbers have actually gone up. It's just uh, everything lags a little bit when it comes to approvals. So, but you can see that our initial trainees are also volunteering and participating in AT. So that's great, great to hear. Uh, when you look at our, just a real quick breakdown of the impact, 408 adults were impacted through our work and 343 youth were impacted through our work. And then uh, this will be like a regular slide just so that we can kind of still see how uh, the impact is being spread across the region. You can see right there our advanced training um, hours or entries on the left with the chapter meetings like tonight uh, taking up um, or comprising the bulk of that. And on the right hand side, you can see um, our volunteer entries in terms of um, us going out to uh, different sites, right, or participating even virtually. And you can see that Benson is taking up um, a good amount of that um, along with chapter business, which is pretty routine, but we can kind of see how we're as a chapter spreading out into the area, into the region and impacting just there. Let's see, that is me. Okay. And thank you for the time. And if, I, if you have any questions, happy to answer any. All right. Well, thank you very much. It's nice yes, being able to see our advancement. Mm -hmm. um, as I'm really don't know if I, I designate myself acting class director because I'm fielding questions and such, and I'm happy to do that for the new class, and mainly because I'll be introducing speakers and such to that group. We did go on a field trip this past Saturday or Sunday to Estero for our butterfly and dragonflies. There weren't as many of those out, but we had a pretty good class turnout. And now next Saturday will be the Palo Alto National Battlefield for that group. So um, the class is doing pretty good along those lines, I think. And we are encouraging them to be sure and log their hours. Okay, River, do you have awards and recognitions for us this, this time? Uh, yes, I do. Since our last meeting, hello everyone, I hope everybody's well. Um, since our last meeting, January 17th, we have, I can get this out from under my cat. <laughs> she likes to sit here with me. 
Okay, uh, we have four recertifications. That would be Joseph Connors, Ann Mayville, Anita Westervelt, and River. We have one, we have three 100 hour milestones, Catherine Krause, Ronnie Scareño, and Jennifer Rectoric. We have one 250 hour milestone, and that is Lisa Adam. And we have one 500 hour milestone, and that's Deli Leno. So congratulations, everybody. Good job. Keep posting. Yes, thank you. I'm getting closer. Oh, and, and Don, I just wanted to say, wasn't there a field trip on Saturday also to Sable Palm? Right? Yes. So two field yes. trips this weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So they've been busy. They've yes, been they busy. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you for reminding us of that. Joseph, do you have anything to report from your end? I know you've been working hard. Yep, I'm definitely uh, got a lot of going on. Uh, I have a, a little bit of info. Um, I don't have any official reports, but our web traffic has gone up a lot on our website, uh, partially thanks to Ronnie. Uh, we, uh, with his help, we've got a lot of the class stuff online so they can access um, the videos of the their class meetings if they need to review something, their speaker notes and all kinds of stuff. So that's a, a really good uh, improvement and help for the class. Uh, it says uh, our our traffic's up like 50 something percent uh, since compared to last month. Uh, and um, uh, what else do we have? There was something else I wanted to talk about, but I can't remember what it is. Well, I know he spent a lot of hours with our speaker getting him coached and prepared uh, because he was very nervous about it. He did a wonderful job, but um, yeah, Joseph, thank you so much. That was very worthwhile for you to take that time. Uh, so we appreciate that so much. And Anita, do you have anything to report? I know you usually are pretty, pretty busy too. If I do, I can't remember it. <laughs> okay. Well, I know you post blogs and write articles and so we, do appreciate that. I've been building three PowerPoint presentations. One will be for the April Home and Garden Show. Okay. All right. Thank you then. Okay. Uh, Kathy Ton, I know she was on earlier, but I also know they're out in the middle of nowhere. Oh, I, I'm sorry. They're on a cruise or something somewhere. I don't see her on here. I don't, I'm not missing her, am I? I don't hear her speaking oh, up. Uh, I've done, yes. I had one more. Uh, yes. Will, William just reminded me. Um, since we're doing stuff with the classes and um, uh, so our arch archive of the videos there is on YouTube in a private, uh, but uh, one of uh, somebody contacted us who's deaf on and wanted to listen to our last meeting uh, with the butterflies. Uh, and Facebook, we have our videos off Facebook Live, but they don't have captions. So uh, since YouTube does automatic captioning, I uploaded it over there. So now we have a, um, a website or a YouTube channel for our chapter. And, the, uh, and so I cleaned up the captions a little bit to help them with scientific names and stuff like that. Uh, and so uh, I think that's a good benefit to our chapter and, and the, the community that we're trying to reach out to more people. Uh, who couldn't have viewed our, our uh, meetings before. And All I'll right. send out everybody a link to uh, that. To, uh, it should be pretty easy to find, but uh, I'll just make sure to let everybody know. And tonight's video will be up there soon, too. Okay. Uh, that's an excellent idea, and i um, glad somebody asked about it. Otherwise, we might not have been prompted to pursue that. So thank you for working on that also. Um, Advanced training, we still have our TMN Tuesdays. Uh, the March one will be coming up um, early in March, usually that first week. And those that were done on January and February are recorded and can be watched anytime this year for, for AT credit. Uh, there are still Texas water webinars under the uh, Water Specialist Texas Parks and Wildlife website. Those can be viewed for AT credit. 
uh, also monarch conservation webinar series. And recently we were advised that Native Plant Society of Texas has some online events and presentations. And um, most of those I would think would be pertinent. Um, they may not address it as specific to our region, but I, I found even coming from the panhandle, I was amazed at, at the number of varieties of plants that are still down here that I knew in the panhandle. So there may be very pertinent programs there. And then our annual meeting recordings are again available. They were not for a while. And I have a meeting tomorrow with the state presidents and I'm gonna ask them the question, are they gonna extend the deadline a couple of weeks since those were, recordings were not available to us. But uh, those that signed up for the annual meeting can still get AT credit for those uh, sessions through the end of April. Um, and Elizabeth, can you think of anything I didn't think of? I know we've been trying to post things out there. No, just what I've shared. I was going to ask you about the um, the annual meeting if that was going to be extended, and I sure hope it is. But I don't have anything other than what I when I see it, I share it. Okay. So. Well, thank you. We appreciate you doing that. And and to can Donna, I, with can the, I can with, I just break in a moment? Mm -hmm. Frank Wiseman has just passed away. Okay. I, I just got a call from his, his nephew. All right. We'll share that information. I don't know if there's a, yeah, there's still quite a few of our members present. So thank you for letting us know that. Okay. Ronnie, did you have something else? I'm sorry to hear that. Mm -hmm. um, it was, it was just a, just really brief for the TMN Tuesdays. Uh, just a quick reminder that the 2021 videos can still be viewed, but only at the start of this year, only the 2022 um, um, sessions can be the ones that are reported. Yep. Okay. Oh, and I don't think I had it in here. Uh, they have set the dates for the uh, virtual volunteer fair. And I don't know if Susan has those, but it'd be, Oh, good. So she can talk about that next. Go ahead, Susan. You have other things to mention. Was the first thing I was going to bring up, I'm going to do a save the day. May 4th and 5th, 2022 is the virtual volunteer fair. One of the issues with the last virtual volunteer fair was that they had very, very few things that um, involved us. They were out of our region. They were not things we could participate in. There is a call for proposals. It is open now through March 25th. I am going to make an effort um, to contact the places where we typically do our volunteer work and see if any of them can do some proposals for some virtual volunteer opportunities in our, our region. So we'll see how that goes. The other thing is, is that starting next week is training sessions for turtle nesting patrol on South Padre Island. So if anyone is interested in that, uh, and I, I've sent out a couple of emails, but you, they may not have registered at the time. If you're interested and you don't find the email, you can one, email me and I will provide you with the contact information. Or two, if you go to this, the uh, Sea Turtle Inc. website, there is a section under volunteers and you can follow their links. Sometimes they're a little convoluted, but uh, that is a wonderful, wonderful reason to go walk on the beach once a week. You learn so, so much. So I would encourage anyone who has that availability to, to look into that. The other thing is, is that the shortage of volunteers is typically on the weekends. They have a lot of volunteers during the week, which kind of surprised me. So if you work and can do it on the weekend, that would be very helpful to them. And that's all I have off the top of my head. I, I, I check everything else off my list, I think. Okay, and I know. putting things to you. I have a question. So, uh, do they train in the weekends too, or is training the, only in the week? 
uh, the training is virtual. It's online. And yes, oh. I believe they did have a weekend session. Oh, okay. It's virtual. Then that's possible then. Okay. It's great. The training Thank is, you. and it's, yeah. um, yeah, it's like from like I'm signed up for next Wednesday and, and mine is from eight to four because I stick around for the ATV training part of it also. And part of it is um, statewide training. And then there's a section of it in the afternoon that is specific to South Padre Island. Okay. Thank you. And anyone who has not done it before, there's an additional virtual session for the first time patrollers. Okay. And I had a note that we had gotten a request for an a TMN educational booth at the Monarch Fest at Kitamont Salon, which will be April 2nd. So we'll follow up with them. It's one of those things we're putting on our calendar um, and see if we can't uh, participate again. We have in the past. They've always been a partner um, agency that we've helped. And so I look forward to working with them again in person this year. And then Robert wanted me to mention the Home and Garden Show at the McAllen Convention Center. April 8th through 10th, he says um, they are going to be selling plants. So if anybody, those of you that have a, the opportunity to um, pot up some plants, some native plants, they'd like that. And they're still looking for another speaker or two uh, on any aspect of native plants and such uh, from our area. I think Anita has already said she's working on a one presentation, so they'd like other presentations if possible. All right, does it, I have left with just a few announcements. Did anybody have any business that I've totally let slip my mind? Um, Sister Mary, do you want to give a make a comment about how um, Ann Mayfield is doing? Um, I can. I haven't talked to Ann today, but um, she was plan she was expecting to go home from the hospital yesterday. Uh, for those that haven't heard and had surgery last Thursday for colon cancer. And uh, the good news is that there was no visible sign of spread of the cancer at surgery. Um, she's waiting for the pathology report to know if there's any microscopic spread uh, that would uh, mean she'd have to have chemotherapy. So she's asked for everyone's prayers that that news is good as well. Um, and then I have a different note. I just wanted to ask if we could go back and ask Anita to say something about Frank Wiseman. I was trying, I knew the name was familiar, and but I couldn't quite place it. And I, so I was just looking and I'm guessing there's others in the meeting that don't know who that person is, but obviously somebody significant. Um, Frank Wiseman helped uh, start the the master naturalist class or um, chapter in uh, San Benito 20, 20 years ago. He was instrumental mm -hmm. in that. He, I, I really can't talk. He was my best friend, mm -hmm. but um, uh, I just, I can't say anything else. Sam. Uh, thanks. A very for significant person for, for both groups because we branched off from that group. So. Yeah, and I think he had like a million uh, TMN volunteer hours too in all of his time. And there's a bench with his name on it at Hugh Ramsey Park. Uh, so anyway, big loss to our community. A few years ago, uh, I attended the uh, presentation of the presidential award for volunteering when he reached his 4,000 hour uh, mark. Uh, so he got the, the presidential award, uh, that was at Ramsey park and, uh, Frank was yes, founding member of, of the Rio Grande Valley chapter. And, uh, he was active in training when I was in training. Uh, he was one of the instructors took us through Ramsey park, showed us all the plants and, and he's well known and, and hanging in there and, and, uh, you know, part of the, the Rio Grande Valley chapter right to the end, I guess. Sorry to hear. Okay. Well, thank you for that information and sharing that. 
and if you get some more information that we can share um, on our um, Google group, uh, we'd be glad to share that with our group. Okay, the other announcements I have are our, our next general meeting is March 21st. Our next board meeting is March 7th. All of these will continue virtual. And then we do have, um, I requested a very short called board meeting immediately after this is closed um, so that we can address one issue. Uh, we've uh, come up with another um, item we might purchase to enhance field trips that we're having. And so we want to discuss that purchase and determine whether or not that's appropriate expenditure at this time. So anybody wants to hang around for that is welcome to. Otherwise, it is 7.55 p.m. So you can record one hour for our um, advanced training with our speaker. Um, um, let me look back. Charles Alexander. I was so you do need to mention that I know. So Charles Alexander on the parrots, and then you can count a half hour 0. 0.50 for our chapter business, uh, our business meeting here this evening. And otherwise, uh, unless you want to hang around for the uh, short uh, um, board meeting, um, I thank everybody for participating. I think it was an excellent presentation from a man who is very nervous about trying this again after a real bad experience, and I thought it was excellent. So thank everybody for being here. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did.